I'll introduce some later on. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, I'll get the essentials over and done with first of all, and that is in, in the unlikely event that there is a fire, um, the alarm will go off um, because I've um, been taken sick from the virus. But she has sent in um, something that she would have said had she attended here. So um, uh, we'll, we'll go in a certain order in a minute. Um, right, so I'll hand over to professional speakers now. Oh, that includes my husband. He's going to be Lorraine Morgan Brinkhurst. But <laughs> we didn't have a wig, so I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> if you can start, and then we'll be going right, my right, to left. Right, thank you. Um, I hope I can do this justice. Um, as Pauline said, uh, Lorraine has said this to us, to, to us today. So I've only read it once, so forgive me if I stumble occasionally. Um, so from Lorraine Morgan Brinkhurst, MBE, uh, Bath Independent Prospective Parliamentary Candidate. I send my sincere apologies that I'm unable to be with you this evening due to having been unwell with neurovirus, which has hit my family and friends. I'm terribly disappointed not to have the chance to join in with your debate this evening, but I am grateful to have the opportunity to address you through my written speech. I recognise that Lord Faulkner's assisted dying bill is really emotive, and I realise that only a small proportion of people in the UK would be assisted should the bill become law. Whilst the bill says the dying patient would have the choice to self-administer the medication at a time that was right for them, I have noticed that many of the high-profile cases that the news has covered recently, sadly, those people would not be able to self-administer due to their disabilities. For those patients in pain, medicine in the 21st century can give great pain relief from palliative care, with sometimes the support of hospice care. <coughs> Excuse me. But what I believe is that medical science is moving on at such a speed that in only a few short years, there could be many cures and also an improvement in medicine. In 2009 to 10, I was at my father's side when he suffered from terminal lung and bowel cancer. His zest for life and desire to be with his family never wavered, even though chemo and radiotherapy, even though even through sorry chemo and radiotherapy. We also, as a family, treasured every moment we spent with him, and the medical and the, and the medical teams gave him us and all the support and he all the support we needed. My father's passing was peaceful with us all at his side in the RUH. If my father had chosen to take his own life, it would have added extra grief to the family. Also possibly a feeling of being robbed of the time we could have had. This might seem selfish that I mention our feelings, but even the day before my father passed away, we were all having a laugh with him at his bedside. Overnight he suddenly deteriorated, and in the morning we had the call and we spent the morning at his side until he passed away. <coughs> I know the bill states that a change in the law on assisted dying would not lead to more deaths, rather it would lead to less suffering for those dying people who want the choice to control how and when they die. To me this still leaves me querying an extra feeling of loss that their loved ones might feel. While as a society we treat people who attempt suicide with compassion and understanding, there is widespread acceptance that suicide is not something to be encouraged or assisted. We should be focusing instead on caring for vulnerable people and on supporting the message of the value of each person. I worked in the health service in Bath for 25 years and the health service staff aims, the health service staff aims are to help patients through illness and injury providing medical support to enable patients to have as fulfilling a life as possible. No one in the health service trains to trains excuse me. No one in the health service trains to then have to make a decision on when someone should die. The bill still puts the emphasis on two doctors making that decision, but this would go against the doctor's training. Research has shown that most doctors do not regard as assisting suicide as an acceptable part of clinical practice and would not participate in it if it were to be made legal. When doctors assess capacity in some patients, they do so with a view to protecting patients from self-harm, not to clear the way for their suicide. 
mental capacity can be affected by all kinds of things, including depression, a frequent concomitant of serious illness, and the effect of medication that is being taken to relieve the symptoms of serious illness. Yet the bill assumes that doctors would be able to determine whether or not a patient has mental capacity without a referral to a psychiatrist or specialist assessment. What I believe is important is the end of life care to enable a patient to die with dignity and pain free with their loved ones around them. The health service locally in Bath, including Serona Care and Health, of which I'm proud to be a non-executive director, provides health and social care on behalf of the council and the CCG. Serona provides patient-centred and end-of-life care. <clears throat> it has been said that what we fear most about dying is the associated loss of control. Talking about dying makes it more likely that you or your loved one will die as you might have wished, and it will make it easier for your loved ones if they knew you have had a good death without having to have gone down to the assisted dying route. My belief is that however life, life can be cruel and some people suffer terribly with illness and disability, life is still precious, and that is why I personally cannot support the bill. Is that within the 10 minutes? Yes. Labour, Dominic Tristan, Green Party, and Ben Howlett for the Conservatives. And now um, we will hear from Steve Bradley. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, as we stated, my name is Steve Bradley, and I'm the Liberal Democrat uh, parliamentary candidate for Bath. Um, assisted suicide, assisted dying, dignity in dying. These are all, in my view, quite negative titles um, for an extremely emotive issue of, of great importance to a lot of people in Bath and beyond. Um, I prefer to think, therefore, of this debate in more positive terms. So I'm here actually to talk with you this evening about dignity and living. Um, over the next few minutes, I'll outline to you my own personal position on what is an extremely emotive issue. And, and to be clear, it will be my personal position because uh, this is a, an issue of conscience and one where I don't believe party politics should tell people uh, how to, uh, what the view should be. I'll explain to you the grounds on which I've reached my own position and therefore how it would influence how I would vote if I was fortunate enough to be the next MP for Bath. Um, and I'll also explain the circumstances in which I would be prepared to change my position on this issue. But throughout I will try to focus on, on the, the more positive aspects of this, uh, with a focus on the principle of ensuring dignity and living rather than dignity and dying. Now, I don't want to give you too much of a part of history about uh, how we got to where we are in this issue, uh, because I'm sure you all know very well, but it's important to touch on a few things. Um, the question of whether terminally ill individuals should have to be entitled to decide the timing and manner of their own death has really risen up the political and public consciousness in recent years. Uh, in large part, as we know, this has been due to the fantastic uh, campaigning of a number of individuals, particularly Debbie Purdy, who has taken the, the state the Director of Public pro pro Prosecutions to court on a number of occasions. Um, at the moment, um, Trump to other nations where assisted suicide is legal, as we know, has, is happening already. It's something that uh, almost 100 Britons have done in recent years. And none of those people have yet been prosecuted under the 1961 Suicide Act. Some of them have actually been charged and have had to wait until those charges were dropped. So prompted by Purdy's case, the Director of Public pro Prosecutions issued new guidelines in 2010 and Debbie Purdy then went on even further and last year challenged the whole issue in the High Court. And for the first time, um, that High Court's action made clear that the UK legal system did have the power to declare our 1961 law on suicide incompatible with human rights legislation. Um, and that therefore kicked the ball into Parliament. Um, so there now appears to be, as I mentioned, widespread public support for clarifying the situation. Um, under what many people believe to be as a cruel system whereby relatives are assisting somebody um, to fulfil their own wishes on the time and manner of their own death uh, needs to be reviewed and decided. So, before going further, I mean, let's not be under any illusion. Again, we, we all know this. Terminally ill people in this country have for many years been choosing some of them to end their lives at a timing and a manner of their own choice. Uh, there are currently around about 25 people a year travelling to dignities in Switzerland about 300 uh, terminal people end uh, their life themselves at the moment, and research suggests about a further 1,000 a year 
um, are, are ending their lives with the help of doctors. Uh, terminally ill people are already deciding when uh, to bring their own lives, uh, to bring their own lives to an end in this country as it is. The manner, obviously, is, is, is less their decision. So Lord Falkner's bill is an attempt to get all of this out of the open and come to a very clear uh, position on what this country wants to do and is moving forwards. So it won't happen this side of the election in May, but it's extremely likely that in the next parliament, parliamentarians will be tasked with ensuring that our legal system does have clear guidance on this deeply emotive subject. Um, and it's with real regret that Debbie Curry unfortunately passed away in December, so she won't be around to see her campaigning work come to an end on this issue either way. Um, in terms of my own view, um, as I mentioned, if, I, if elected as AMP for Bath and me, I'll be one of the parliamentarians who has to take a view on this. I, I, I have a bit of a philosophical view on this issue. Um, one of the cornerstones of being a liberal is that you believe that the people who know best in terms of solutions to any individual circumstances is in the state and it is in private companies, but it's actually those individual people themselves. Um, so my view is, so as long as you're an adult of sound mind, I believe no one can judge better than you can what the appropriate solutions to your own individual circumstances in life, in anything in life, are. And I passionately believe in that core individual right, that right of individual freedom. A second cornerstone of liberalism is the belief in empowering people and communities and giving them not only the right to decide what's best for their circumstances, but giving them the power to do something about it. Now, Obviously decisions about which individual and communities take need to be done in a way that doesn't negatively impact on other people. Um, but I passionately believe that we need a world where people can make the right decisions, best decisions for them, and they're able to do so. And I believe uh, that's the approach I would take looking forward on this issue. So given that's the philosophical view in which I look at this issue, you'll probably make it as no surprise to you that I support Lord Falkner's bill on the city dying. I believe that if faced with intolerable pain, uh, that some terminally ill adults of sound mind and clear judgment should have the right to decide the manner and the timing that their life comes to an end. I don't believe the state, other individuals, private companies or anybody else has the right to overrule the decision of an adult of sound mind and judgment in those circumstances. So to understand why that's my personal belief, I'll go back to kind of where I began on this. I don't believe in dignity in dying. I believe in dignity in living. I see no dignity in using the weight of the law, the weight of the state, to force a terminally ill individual to live out the final days of their life in intolerable suffering against their own wishes. I see no dignity in forcing those who are determined to choose the timing and manner of their own death to travel overseas to do, to, to do so and to put the loved ones at great legal risk in the process. And I see no dignity at all in the state and the law deciding that it knows better than any individual in those circumstances what the appropriate solution should be. So, I would therefore support the right of an individual to take such a decision, but there would have to be a number of strong qualifications as outlined in Lord Faulkner's bill. Um, Firstly, assisted dying should absolutely not be routinely available. It should instead be a carefully managed, heavily scrutinised, strictly scrutinised process preserved for those who meet five criteria, all five of five criteria. Firstly, they must be an adult. Secondly, they must be of sound mind. Thirdly, they must be in an advanced stage of suffering from an incurable illness uh, with its prognosis suggesting that they've got six or less months to live. Fourthly, they must be given full information on alternative palliative care options that are available to them. Uh, assisted suicide should never be presented as the only or as the preferred solution. And finally, it must be clearly, entirely and demonstrably that individual's own decision to bring their own life to a dignified and early end. Now, there's obviously a lot of critics of assisted suicide, of the whole process, and they, they warn that a formal change in the law could leave people vulnerable to family pressure uh, and pressure from others to end their lives. Um, or that people may feel they're a burden on the state, a burden on other people. So to ensure the above safeguards are met, the bill has suggested that firstly, two doctors independently need to assess any patient who's requesting assisted suicide, uh, and they must be satisfied that all five of those criteria are met. Then a High Court judge, judge sorry, will also need to be involved in the process, 
and, and to come to the conclusion that the patient had reached a clear and settled decision to control the timings and manner of their own death. And then on top of that, there should be a mandatory period of reflection at the end. So there are a number of safeguards involved in the, in, in the proposal within Lord Faulkner's bill. And on top of that, they must at any time be entitled to withdraw their request for an assisted suicide. So I believe that we can have a system which would give dying adults peace of mind that the choice of assisted suicide, assisted dying is there for them if they should wish it, and it's done in a way with enough safeguards to ensure the public decisions are being taken. Uh, we'll probably hear a lot tonight about the state of Oregon in America, which in 1997 passed its own assisted dying rule. There's no evidence at all uh, that there's been abuse, and there's been no calls uh, for it to be extended beyond terminal illnesses ever since, so it seems to be working over there. Um, finally, would there be any grounds on which my, the view I've just given you, my own personal view of assisted dying, would change? Uh, there would be two, potentially. Firstly, if I am fortunate enough to be elected in May as an ex-MP for Bath, my job basically will be to represent the views of everybody in the constituency, not really my own views. So I would give you a commitment tonight. Uh, if elected as your MP, I would put in place a number of mechanisms so that I can listen to the views of the ordinary residents of Bath uh, on this important topic. And there's a whole host of ways in which that would need to be done. For example, I don't think the internet is an appropriate way because not all elderly people uh, use the internet. But I, I would put in place a number of mechanisms to get a clear steer on what the people of Bath think on this issue. And if it was clear that a majority of Bathonians did not agree with assisted dying, and it would need to be clear, I would vote to reflect that opinion. Because at the end of the day, I would be elected to represent the people of Bath in Westminster, more of my own views. Secondly, I believe in evidence-based decision-making. And I believe, as I said, an individual has been given the freedom and the empowerment to make their own decisions. So if we did have assisted dying in this country, and if it became clear that individuals weren't making decisions of their own accord, and that was being abused and the five safeguards weren't being met, then I would understandably seek to review my decision on that basis. So I'm very, therefore very supportive of the fact that within Lord Faulkner's bill, there's a sunset clause that enables after 10 years if the, if the legislation no longer has the support of Parliament, it can definitely be taken off the statute book quite easily. So, to conclude, I hope that explains to you all um, how I view this issue personally, um, what I would like to see happening now with regards to the law, the safeguards I would like to see in there, which echo what's in Lord Faulkner's bill, um, and the what grounds that I would consider altering my view if elected as your parliamentarian in May. So I'll basically finish where I began again. I do genuinely believe that individuals are best placed to decide what's right for them and their circumstances. I don't think the state is, I don't believe private companies are, and I don't believe anybody else is. So I therefore believe, and I also believe, sorry, in the aim of dignity in living. So I therefore believe that we should allow individuals of demonstrably sound mind during the latter stages of terminal illness to decide in time and manner of their own passing. Um, I believe it's a liberal solution and I, delete, and I believe it's the appropriate answer to this difficult and I'm going to talk. Thank you very much. Hi there, yes, my name is Ollie Middleton. I'm the Labour parliamentary candidate for Bar. Um, so fundamentally, I believe in the right to choose the right to choose to die in dignity, free of extreme mental and physical pain. But vitally, and this is why I think Lord Falkland's bill is so important, free of fear. And at the moment, the current law isn't working, as many people with terminal illnesses are not free of fear. Instead, they are burdened with the worry that if things get too painful, too difficult, the choice to die in dignity will not be available to them. The law has to change. I fully support Labour peer, Lord, um, sorry, Charlie Faulkner's effort to achieve that change. If Lord Faulkner's bill does become law, it will ensure that families and patients do not experience any unnecessary suffering. It will also ensure clarity in an area that is all too often unclear. 
Now, I appreciate that there are people that fear a change in the law could have unintended consequences. However, the bill also seeks to protect vulnerable citizens such as the elderly, the disabled and the vulnerable, and those with mental conditions. And I do also believe that Lord Faulkner's bill provides the safeguards necessary to ensure that the law is not abused. Now, any patient considered for dying must be terminally ill, and the doctor must be satisfied with their full mental capacity, and they must also be fully informed of all end-of-life care that could be available to them. And they must also be free from pressure when making the decision. Now, I don't believe that this is a case of palliative care or the right to die. In fact, I believe we should be doing all we can to support, improve and enhance existing care options available to people. In many cases of terminally ill, sorry, in the case of terminally ill patients, the role of palliative care has and always will be vital. And Lord Faulkner's bill, in my opinion, rightfully recognises that. I do really hope that this bill will become law, and I do really hope that we can give the terminally ill the right to choose not to suffer against their will. So I look forward to tonight, I look forward to hearing um, the opinions around the room, um, obviously um, I look forward to answering your questions as well. So thank you very much. No, um, one of the benefits of coming third or fourth, I don't know, a bit, uh, no, third, second or third, is uh, that I don't have to go over what the bill says, because I think that's the covered pretty well by these guys. So you've saved five minutes for me wishing off, which is good. Um, so my position, to be clear, um, the, the Green Party, I mean, I, I, I guess we might be unusual in this case that the party actually has a position on this, because uh, we believe basically that there should be no uh, legislation um, on anything you could do that doesn't affect anyone else, more or less. I mean, that's a very sort of brief summary, but that's true. So in that sense, we are libertarian, or that's a difficult sort of uh, label. Um, so our position is actually that if you are, um, if you have considered yourself ready to die for various reasons, then within limits specified by the bill, we are happy for you to do that and we support your right to do it. And then, so in summary, I support the bill. Now, I do have some concerns. Um, I would like to see an amendment for uh, a psychiatrist, not just two doctors, but actually a psychiatrist as well, to say that you're mentally suitable. Because, I know, don't get me wrong, doctors are great, but they're not all psychiatrists. So it's quite, it's quite difficult to, to see somebody, and the bill doesn't specify in too much detail how well they have to know the patient. So I would like to see that put in, actually. Uh, that doesn't mean I don't support it, and I wouldn't vote for it as it stands, but I would like to see that amendment. So why, why do I think that? Well, as I say, it's the party line, and also, we, we all, I think we all know in this room at least one person who's, who's suffered and, and has um, had an unpleasant death. Um, I see it my, I've seen it myself, and uh, the approach from different people is quite different. I know also people who will fight to the end, and also people who really have had enough. And, and who are we to say, you know, if they're of sound mind and they, they've tried all the options and, they, and it's a certainty, as the bill specifies, then who are we to say they can't um, put an end to their suffering? Um, yes, it's hard on families, but ultimately I don't think families should ever be able to overrule the wish of a patient. I would hope that the patient has talked to the families, but I don't think we should legislate for that. I think in the end you are the master of your own destiny and it's up to you to consider what your family's feelings are, not the state to consider. So in the end you are, as I say, it's up to you, the safeguards are good, there needs to be additional, um, additional safeguards of psychiatry. Um, and I'll just end by saying I don't think the dangers are particularly, they're sometimes overstated by opponents of the bill. Um, doctors already to a certain extent have some power of life or death over patients, and we all know this. Um, there's things like you know, quality adjusted life years where you decide actually whether you'll get drugs or not because of the cost. You know, that's not directly killing you. And I'm not saying they're doing this at all to be malicious or at all, you know, it's a perfectly valid clinical decision. But it's a decision that they all that they will make. So some people will live and some people will die based on the cost of the drugs. Now, in a finitely resourced system, that's always going to be true. So morally there's not a huge amount of difference between that and allowing somebody to end their own life. 
But you could say that the indirect map is, is much less morally ambiguous because that person has chosen, chosen that route. And so, personally, I don't have a problem with it. Um, it's in the liberal tradition of letting people do what they want. And, uh, and I think we should, as I will support it, um, and, uh, and everyone in the past will support it. So, thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Um, and thank you very much for what they all say. We're going to the luxury. Normally we end up with two minutes to be able to speak in, so ten minutes is a politician's dream, I tell you. Um, but unfortunately, I do have about ten minutes of the speech to um, give to you. Um, I won't repeat, obviously, some of the things that have already been said um, earlier on, but as we know, yes, the uh, bill is up, uh, it's just gone through second reading of the House of Lords and it's going through to committee stage at the moment. And uh, we're quite right in saying that uh, there is not going to be time before the general election in order to debate this within the House of Commons. So whoever does end up becoming the MP for Bath that after the general election, it will more than likely fall upon our shoulders in order to debate that particular subject. Um, it's, an it's, an uh, sorry, it's an enormously emotive subject that uh, we're talking about today. It has torn families and friends apart for generations. Uh, on a purely personal uh, basis, it's a subject which uh, is incredibly raw to me at the moment. Uh, a couple of months ago in autumn, I lost my grandmother to uh, a long-term eight-year battle between uh, vascular dementia and also uh, five or six strokes. Uh, that saw a woman who uh, was a stalwart and matriarch of a, of a lady um, turn into a woman who ended up having to move between chair and bed and bed and chair for eight years worth of her life. And uh, that affected myself and my uh, family. My mother's disabled and she was her carer. And um, the assisted dying debate has caused me, as I've said to a number of people in this room, over the last uh, few months, to, uh, the last few years rather, to reconsider my own position. And I've said there's a number of different debates. I was, uh, once upon a time, um, partly because of my own religion, uh, someone that would have said no to this debate uh, and no to Sister Dine, but I have really reflected upon that and uh, changed my views. Um, I've therefore decided this evening to actually put aside my uh, personal experience and approach this with impartiality and talk about the merits of the actual uh, bill presented instead. And the government believes that this vote should, of course, be one of uh, moral conscience rather than it should be a whipped vote. So, um, in terms of the next parliamentary session, um, I really want to ensure that I do take into account all sides of the debate and all views on this. And uh, I've already said many times that uh, on any free vote, um, for those of us that are on uh, the internet, uh, and I get a lot of emails, uh, please feel free for goodness sakes to get in contact with me when this free vote does come up and also on any other free vote as well. But in particular, um, do write to me and uh, at my regular constituency surgeries and already on the meet the candidate events around uh, the constituency, I would like to hear your views and I will make sure I free up some time to um, hear a, a two-way conversation on that. But on one side, in terms of the debate itself, we need to make sure that we do not push people into things that they actually don't want for themselves by enforcement and regulation. And on the other side, we do want to ensure that there's an opportunity for people to decide how they want to end their own lives should they be in a mentally competent state. For too long there's been a stigma attributed to the issue of death and as a population becomes more elderly, no doubt this subject is going to become incredibly more uh, salient over the coming months and years as well. And uh, a few months ago I was out door knocking and uh, bumped into Pauline and um, thank you very much for taking so much time and effort for putting on today. But um, I'm pleased that you're going to organise this debate and really put this to, to the fore um, during the general election uh, debates uh, series as well. Um, since then I've received a large number of uh, letters in my inbox um, from different constituents writing to me about this particular subject and uh, I actually want to share a letter uh, that I received from someone which I think actually sums up uh, very nicely why the law I think needs to be amended. Uh, of course in the interest of confidentiality I've taken out the names of uh, the people that uh, they're referring to. So I'll read it out to you. In April 2011, I was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. My oncologist advised me that my condition is terminal and the treatments available are palliative in nature. As previously a healthy 42-year-old, this diagnosis came as an enormous shock. I've been on palliative chemotherapy treatment for most of the time since my diagnosis, 
and this is uh, slowed the disease but not prevented its continued progression. I'm now coming to the end of the viable treatment options and my short term future looks increasingly bleak. A few months after I received my diagnosis, my father-in-law was also diagnosed as being terminally ill. In 2011, he unfortunately passed away. During the days leading up to his death, he suffered terribly. He made, uh, he made it quite clear to his family that he had reached a point at which he simply wished to die so that he might avoid further pain. He also knew that the Lord denied him any assistance in ending his life. Watching my father-in-law undergo such a painful end it was an extremely traumatic experience for all concerned and left my wife and her mother feeling that they had failed their father by not being able to release his suffering. I thought a great deal about how I might feel in my father-in-law's position. Uh, I am strongly of the position, uh, sorry, strongly of the opinion that the law in this country needs to be changed, that terminally ill people with a short time to live and are of, uh, who are of sound mind should have the right to assisted dying. I'm not ashamed to admit that I'm afraid of the process of dying if this entails severe suffering. It would be of comfort to know that I would be able to gain assistance in ending my life should my suffering become unbearable. Today it is the case that some people who undergo extremely painful and distressing final days would much rather say that they could be assisting to die in a humane and dignified manner. As someone potentially facing an end involving great pain and suffering, I find it unconscionable that the law prohibits me from making my own choice between life and death. It is simply a matter of deciding when and in what circumstance death arrives. Since replying to this particular uh, resident, I have thought long and hard about what politicians can do in order to help, uh, in order to help him, and I wrote back to him on, on this uh, particular issue. He clearly has views on the issue, and it's important that I work to listen to all residents and all their views when uh, making up a uh, position on the issue, uh, on the votes in the House of Commons. I personally want to ensure that we reduce pain and suffering as much as we can, whilst we ensure protections are in place uh, for those that do not wish to make uh, a decision to end their life early. Some may dismiss the bill outright, however I think the balance can be struck on this issue as long as proper statutory protections are considered. And I've read the bill and there are a number of questions that I would like answered and possible amendments uh, made before I vote in favour. And I've classified these under three headings. The first being limitations to the practicality of the bill, the second being regulatory and criminal amendments that I'd like to see made to the bill, and thirdly, uh, minimising the consequences for the medical professionals uh, as well. Very much hope that the House of Lords Committee, when they're going through their committee stage, will be able to present the bill to the Commons for debate when some of these amendments have been uh, made or uh, considered. So in terms of my views on the actual bill itself, uh, and the first point I made about limitations to practicality, under section 3 of the Declarations, paragraph 1, part A, it quotes, the person has made a signed declaration to that effect in the form in the schedule of the presence of a witness who must not be a relative or directly involved in the person's care or treatment, who signed the declaration in the person's presence. To me, the bill opens uh, by stating that if you are mentally competent, you can apply this bill. What about those who are physically incapable? What if the individual is incapable of signing? Now, someone with a disabled mother, I know that at, once, at some stage in her life, that her hands will be incapable to be able to sign these documents, so actually it's not stated in terms of the actual intricacies are in the bill itself, what that actually means. And further to that, in paragraph 6, it states, the person who has made a declaration under this section may revoke it at any time, and revocation need not be in writing. Now, I'm concerned when the individual revokes their intent to die, then how, it can, uh, how can it be proven if it is not in writing? Perhaps we need to look at uh, witnesses at that stage, and uh, I do not believe that the bill at the moment has enough conclusive evidence in that. Uh, I, of course, uh, this is a particular concern for someone that has communications difficulties. In terms of the regulatory and cr criminal amendments, in section 4, paragraph 8, uh, in the event that the person decides not to self-administer the medicine, uh, we must immediately remove it from the person and as soon as reasonably practical, uh, return it to the pharmacy from which it was dispensed. There's a rather large number of cases within the bill itself that doesn't actually give any proper regulatory advisory notes. And if I was sitting in the committee stage of the House of Commons, then you would end up having to see the regulatory guidance that comes along with it. And as it stands, the Faulkner Bill doesn't necessarily have that and says that it is up to the Secretary of State to decide. Well, actually, I would like to see further advisory notes presented to the uh, Commons, uh, if, it, of course, it's not provided during the um, committee stage of the House of Lords. In addition, um, the Code of Practice section, which is the most important, 
Um, I won't quote you in the exact phrase, but um, in terms of the effects of depression or other psychological disorders that may impair a person's decision making, uh, it doesn't state what sort of time frames that these are uh, looked over and also what the effects of reasonable doubt would be as well. And uh, I would seek further clarification before anybody makes a decision on that particular piece. And um, particularly important is obviously the offensive side. And uh, you can imagine in the House of Commons, no doubt, uh, there will be a large amount of uh, disagreement and argument over the, um, uh, over the actual incarceration period here. And in the incarceration period, it seems to be no longer than five years or a fine or both. And the question really will be, is that strong enough in order to provide enough for the deterrence? I know it's a side festival going on. But <laughs> Um, and thirdly, minimising the consequences for the medical professional. Now, I've had many a debate on this. My brother's a doctor, and um, he wants to make sure that enough protections are made and levied uh, in case he's ended up um, dragged into the courts if their protections aren't available or strong enough. So, for example, um, we need to be working very closely with the Royal Colleges on the actual bill itself before anything is passed into statute um, to discuss given recent circumstances with Royal Colleges changing their mind, we need to make sure that's absolutely concrete before any judgment is made. So in summary, I'd like to see a number of amendments made to the bill in order to protect those uh, who are either asking uh, to end their life or to those administrating the uh, medicine to end one's life early. The biggest problem for me is that there needs to be stringent regulatory advice legislation drafted and I want to see proper parliamentary time to debate the subject and the General Medical Council needs to be able to police this effectively. I appreciate, that, I appreciate that opinion polls have consistently shown overwhelming public support for assisted dying, and I'm also fully aware of the concerns that arise in connection to this topic. However, I believe that with proper safeguards, these could be effectively mitigated. Uh, Steve talked earlier on about what's going on over in Oregon for, uh, for the last 14 years in the USA, and the Oregon experience shows that the common concerns expressed regarding assisted dying does not manifest themselves into practice. If this can be replicated in the rest of the UK, um, we can manage the expectations of both sides of the argument. Um, it is important that we give enough debate for this subject, and uh, if I do become your MP, then I hope I'll be able to open up the debate to everyone here. And um, what well, like I can say is hopefully that gives you a good understanding of my views on the uh, bill itself, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions on the bill. Thank you very much.
if you're looking at other comparison debates on a free vote basis, um, vast majority of the times the law doesn't get passed within that same green speech and then it battered off into the second green speech. Uh, I'm afraid on this particular issue, due to the fact uh, of its controversial nature and the amount of um, conscience, uh, religious issues that will end up being no doubt drafted into the actual bill itself and the debate on that being held in the House of Commons, um, aside from even thinking about government time, then this is going to rumble on for a long period of time. Um, but I think that's probably a good thing in relation to this. We're talking about politicians deciding whether people are going to, uh, to die effectively. And that's a huge, huge amount of pressure that's going to be put on all of us. See that just as candidates, and I'm not doing it on behalf of all of us here, it's a huge issue of moral conscience. As politicians, as uh, MPs, it's going to be even more difficult to manage to manage those expectations. Um, we've, we've had previous attempts to sort of pass similar legislation, they failed. Um, but I personally and genuinely believe there's, there's much more of an evident groundswell of support to do something on this issue amongst the public. I think the high profile cases, which are the most high profile cases, but there's been a number of them, have really helped to colour and flavour the debate nationally around what should happen on this issue. Um, and let's not forget as well that since the, the High Court judgment of last year, uh, there's a bit more urgency and immediacy around clarifying this issue. The court has made very clear that uh, we are effectively out of step with European human rights legislation on this, that therefore uh, it's probably only a matter of time before somebody challenges this ruling on that basis uh, in court and wins, and they therefore effectively ask Parliament to tidy this whole area up. So I think it will happen because it will partly have to happen um, in terms of legal pressure. Uh, in terms of how the vote goes in, in Parliament, I really don't think it, we, we know. I would hope it would reflect the view of the, the public. Politicians aren't always in step with the view of, of, of the general public, but because it's a free vote, I, I, I hope and expect it may well be. Um, there's opposition in all parties, actually, to on this issue, motivated by a whole variety of, of things, uh, you know, personal opinion, religious belief, everything else. Um, the balance of parties in, in Parliament will probably play some factor to an extent in terms of how likely it is to go through. <coughs> Uh, but in summary, I think this is a piece of legislation whose time is definitely coming. I think it's probably one whose time has come. Uh, the legal system has said that its time is basically here. Um, and I hope that uh, politicians will reach a conclusion within the next parliament and ideally within the, the, the first few years of the parliament. Any other questions? I was going to ask you if any of you feel the bill doesn't go far enough. Um, I mean, something that concerns me, although I don't know the answer to it, is that mental suffering can sometimes be far worse than physical suffering. So, if somebody is terminally ill with, say, cancer, which is also severely depressed, which is tripping their suffering, they are disqualified from this, are they? Uh, or, if Somebody is near the end of very near the end of their life, and I don't have certain forms of Alzheimer's. They may be suffering very, very badly, but uh, not least because they can't express their pain, where it's hurting, or the rest of it. Administering palliative care to somebody in that situation is very, very difficult. But if they're deemed of not uh, sound mind, then presumably they're excluded from this. So the people who suffer most are the people who actually are excluded, as far as I can see. But if I got that wrong, um, I have got it right. Is there any scope for this being pushed a bit further at this stage or in the future? Mm -hmm. This is why I'd like to see the psychiatrists included as an amendment. Um, I think mental health is a very complicated subject, which people obviously study for their whole lifetimes. So to have two doctors, and, uh, as far as I know, the bill just says doctors, they could be any kind of doctor. Um, I don't think that's enough. I think, and this isn't just to protect people, but this is also to include people. So if the psychiatrist determines that actually, in their, in their view, even though that person might not appear of sound mind, but they are, I mean, some of these diagnoses are very tricky, then that's an important input to have. Now, I mean, I, I don't want to go beyond the scope of this particular bill too much, but, you know, we believe in things like the rules and stuff, you know. A, we think, it, yes, the law should go further. 
but that's outside this particular debate. But as far as we can make this bill, yes, I'd like to see something. You, you hit the nail on the head. In reality, I mean, Lord Falkland's bill specifically doesn't mention what you've been talking about there because he knows that that is so controversial within the political establishment that you've got to go through certain stages. You know, we've taken 40, 50 years to get to this point in time, and this is one of the best bills that has ever been presented before the House of Commons. There's absolutely every, uh, sorry, uh, before Parliament, rather. Um, it's obvious the reason why it's going through the House of Lords first rather than through the House of Commons, because a lot of people will try and do weird things with it without having the expertise in order to manage that. So I'm not going to get the House of Lords expertise on this, but um, I do not want to see it muddied to an extent with what you've just been talking about there at this stage. Later on, if this bill ends up being made into law, we're probably talking about a further parliament thereafter via another free vote in order to look at that. We, we don't know mental health well enough at the moment. Um, successive governments have failed on their investment programs in mental health services. Dominic's absolutely right. Uh, it's so complicated that as soon as you even give uh, particularly MPs an opportunity to uh, get involved in those sort of debates, that, that I have to say they would be completely out of their depth in order to do that. I'm not being insulting to MPs here if it's a statement of fact. Uh, so I'm actually quite glad that the expertise that we've got in the House of Lords are looking at this particular bill at the moment. And I would also like to see if what you're saying in terms of the amendment you'd like to be made or a further bill, that also starts off in the House of Lords as well by having the experts sort of begin that process of draft legislation. Does the bill go far enough? I think at this point, in terms of acceptability, yes. Um, I think in reality, possibly not. Um, with regards to your point on, on mental health, I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult one. I mean, obviously, you, you, you highlight a specific example in which perhaps someone may have a terminal illness, but they may also have something like Alzheimer's as well. Um, and obviously, the, the, the bill in its current form would not allow for that person um, to, to qualify for assisted dying. I think one of the main reasons for that is not just because the person um, is, is not full mental capacity then but therefore may be um, thought to not be making a fully informed decision but the reason that, um, that the bill doesn't allow for people with mental health um, problems as well as terminal illnesses um, to qualify for assisted dying is because obviously it does open up um, risks in terms of pressure um, if, if someone has got something like Alzheimer's there may be cases where they're more likely to be pressured into making a certain decision um, for whatever reason, and obviously that is, is, a, is a risk. And I think that's the reason why at the moment um, the bill doesn't allow for um, what you're suggesting in, in terms of um, mental health issues. Um, legal systems tend to hate grey areas. Um, I think the, the five key criteria uh, in Lord Faulkner's bill make a difficult issue as black and white at this stage as is possible. You can demonstrate that somebody is of sound mind by our, by our, 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 our classical definition, you can demonstrate that somebody's an adult. You can demonstrate that they've willingly signed up to it and literally signed up to it. Once you get into the realms of issues around uh, people are suffering from depression and mental health issues, it becomes greyer and less black and white. Um, and that would, I suspect, cause a lot of potential issues legally. Um, so I think the set of checks and balances we've got in the Laura Faulkner's legislation at the moment are, are right. I would agree with Dominic, I think it would be helpful to add in a degree of psychoanalysis as well because um, you have to demonstrably prove that somebody is a sound mind in order to meet the criteria, so we should just double check uh, with an appropriate professional on that. Uh, but I think to throw the net too wide at this time, we would first introduce grey areas into a really complicated a piece of legislative process and cause problems, and secondly, it would probably reduce the chances of it getting through Parliament. I think the focus now needs to be on getting something through to clarify the legal position in this country, and then afterwards, any possible changes to widen the net could then be looked at. Can I ask a further point? I think I'd just take another further point on this point. Yeah. Uh, is anyone here a member of Dignity and Dying? Yeah. yeah. There's one thing, if there's a way, I haven't 
contacted them about this, but there is something that I get quite frustrated about, and it's the misapplication of this particular bill in that some uh, people within the dignity and dying groups are going off to say on the airwaves, this is a sort of um, salvation to a huge number of different, um, different cases, and where people aren't um, terminally ill, for example, but are incurably ill, they are seeming to try and apply this piece of legislation uh, to their issues as well. I mean, there's a famous case of uh, Nicholson and um, Lamb, and if there's a way that we can take a message from tonight to go to Dignity and Dying, for example, to say, look, stay on course, stay on the message that you have been doing, that you've been promoting for a period of time now, that's actually working quite nicely in able to get this uh, piece of legislation through the House of Commons. Um, then my plea is we're going to say let's not muddy the waters and let's just keep on focus and try and get this one through first before we start sort of trying to do all things to all people because otherwise it does become incredibly complicated uh, within, the, within the parliamentary process. Yeah. And the case of Oregon, which, which we mentioned earlier, which has had for nearly 20 years had very similar legislation, they haven't had calls to take it further there in that period of time. Certainly not credible pressure to take it further, which suggests that by the understanding of, of the people who live in the state of Oregon, that they've probably got it about right at the moment. So mm -hmm. I, you know, at, at the moment, I don't see why we necessarily go further. But again, I think the focus needs to be on, let's get this on the statute book now. And then if people wanted to take it further, they could then lobby on, them, uh, on that basis. Um, yes, would you like to speak? Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm Mike and I work at Dignity and Dying. <laughs> but uh, I don't think we don't really even take that back. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we don't um, ever try and use the argument by doing that. Nicholson and Lamb are something what our opponents see, and they try and leave waters and confuse people that we're campaigning for assisted suicide. When actually we're only campaigning for assisted dying. And the problem is we don't have such high-profile case study as Nicholson and Lamb because mm. the, our our case is terminally ill. You know, last six months of life, they're, they're not able to go to court. And, uh, and find a case, so I think mean, that's, that's, our, that's our issue. And we're, try, we're trying to find um, a case at the moment to, to, to have a high profile legal case, but it's uh, like, incredibly difficult to find someone. Um, but um, I like all your optimism uh, that you think in the next parliament that we'll get a bill for you. That's, that's great, it means I'll be out of a job, but it's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But my, my um, twice then, uh, an assisted dying bill has come before the House of Lords, and it's great that this year um, we seem to make good headway. And two thirds of the peers in the House of, in the House of Lords seem to be supportive of the bill. Um, that's what it's shown um, in three votes uh, over the Parliament, which is great. Um, but I looked at some data before I left the office today, and less than a third of MPs are supportive of the bill. From our counting. Um, <clears throat> I was just want to say why you think that is. And often MPs are, when they're PPCs like yourselves, they are supported. Uh, and then when they get off, when they get into office, they uh, they withdraw from their pre previous opinion. Nick Clegg being an example. Um, why do you think that is, and why why it hasn't? Um, Commons has really grappled with this issue. Like, why, why hasn't there been a private member's bill in the House of Commons? Happy to answer that one. Uh, yeah. I think we probably all know the reasons why. It's one of the most controversial um, bipolar uh, arguments that you can have. Um, I would have to say, particularly in the Conservative Party, you've got a rather substantial number of members of the Conservative Party that have. Uh, particular religious views. Um, I mean, I hold up my hands, by the way, I'm a Christian myself, but I'm a pragmatist enough to realise that actually we should be having these sort of debates outside. Um, politicians for a long period of time sort of said one thing on the doorstep and then done something completely different in Parliament because they don't think people are watching. Well, funny enough, people do watch now and you get held to account if you say something completely different to two different types of people. Um, and one thing that would be incredibly important would be to make sure this is done on a cross-party basis outside of the whips by getting a lot of backbenchers together to sign up to the bill. Uh, a lot of MPs who are currently in marginal constituencies are so worried about the fact that, oh well, one of my opponents will uh, smack me down on this. 
uh, in particular after a big UKIP are a big uh, problem on this because every time the Conservative Party says something on a moral issue, uh, I mean gay marriage for example is a prime example, you end up with UKIP saying, oh we wouldn't have done that but then they'll do it anyway yeah. and then we lose as a result uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and a lot of people in Parliament are thinking obviously they want to keep their own jobs, they have to say that, but they, that's what they're thinking. Uh, for me, I don't really care. I have my principles and my convictions, and if people don't disagree, if people don't agree with me on my convictions and my principles, then fine, vote me out. But at least I can stay sane and uh, able, able in, um, in terms of saying exactly the same thing to two different people at the same time. All right. Yeah. Just, just quickly, um, I think you're quite positive because, I mean, no offense, Ben, I think there'll be fewer right wing MPs in the next part. And also, <laughs> and also, it doesn't look like any party to have a majority. So, much as coalitions are maligned, um, whatever arrangement there is, there will be more of a need for cross party support. There will be enough parties, whether it's the SNP or others or any other party, that supports this bill, that the parties that don't will be convinced, I think, to a large extent, to support it enough to go through. Um, well, I mean, um, I think, I'm slightly shocked actually that only a third of MPs apparently support um, the bill because obviously that, that's not in line um, with the vast majority of, of, of public opinion. So in terms of there being any political mileage to exploit through opposing the bill, well I would imagine there'd be relatively little because most people do support it. Um, I mean, obviously, party whips aren't going to really feature if this does go to a vote, because it will be a vote of conscience, will be a free vote. Um, so, in terms of drawing comparisons to other examples where parties have said certain things and done something else, I mean, it's slightly different, obviously, because there, there won't be a, a party line to take. Um, so, I mean, I, I, um, I can only hope like I said previously, that the public opinion is reflected um, in any potential vote, and I mean, hopefully we will, we will see that happen, hopefully we will see the, uh, the bill passed. So I'm going to just dump in there, apologies, so it would be very interesting, if, I'm sure you've got the stats, but if you ask MPs, without them having to put up their hand in the middle of the Commons or be on a named list of MPs attributed with the bill, how many of them would end up supporting the position and how many would be against. And I have a funny suspicion, on the basis that it wouldn't end up being reported, you'd end up with a huge increase in that third, up to about a half. Yeah, it would be quite interesting. Right. Well, well, that's not like you've done a lot of in this country. No, 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 no. I've ask all their PDCs to see where they stand and so they can try and uh, collect that information and you'll record that secretly recorded. It's very interesting that um, this has become the Lords, which is certainly traditionally viewed as a more reactionary of the two chambers. People in the Lords are utterly insulated from public opinion. They're the ones who don't have to go out and get elected. Once you're there, you're there for life. Uh, Tony Benn had to go to court to, to lose the right to be a Lord. Um, <laughs> the police also has a number of bishops there who you know, have not been critical at all. They're entitled to their opinion on this as well, but will come at it with a very strong religious view. Um, so it is quite interesting that the gun in the Lords. Um, and uh, I mean, in terms of MPs and the Green benches, so in terms of Parliament itself, I mean, we, we can guess some of the reasons why some MPs are against. I'm surprised as much as the third. Um, there are opponents and proponents in all parties of this. Um, I'd be absolutely confident that more than a third of Liberal Democrats are in favour of this motion. Uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the peace policy. Um, I mean, some will be opposed on religious beliefs, and again, they're perfectly entitled to, um, to do so. Um, some people will uh, be evidence-based. Um, you, know, you mentioned Nick Clegg, he's changed his view, and he's, he's been very clear on why he's changed his view, but the Norman Lamb, who is the government's health, oh, sorry, who's the government's health minister in charge of care, he's actually changed the other way. He began opposed to um, assisted dying and has changed his view and he's been very clear about his change of view because of speaking to the relatives and speaking to uh, people themselves who want to go through this process. So you know, I don't think anybody can be criticised for their, for their stance as long as you know, it's based on their own firmly held beliefs on this and some people will probably change their view on personal circumstances as well. Um, 
as was mentioned, I do think the political balance of, part of the next parliament will, will play a key part in this. I also hope that we will have less right wing MPs, um, and, I, and I expect that if that was the case, we'd have more people who would be open minded on this. But to conclude, sort of, I've made my position very clear on this, and that's the position for the, if elected as your MP in May, I would look to take into, into parliament. Um, I wouldn't look to proselytise and evangelise other people to change to agree with me because uh, it's a matter of conscience. But I'm very clear on how I, I would vote. I, I've laid it out to you all, um, and I'm hopeful that we'll get the majority eventually. If only for the fact that the legal system is telling us we have to tighten this whole area up. Him only through a website, and I sent several emails, but I didn't have any. They, they do live in the 1950s, I think. <laughs> 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 do we know if they have any sort of policy? Emails, do we know if they have any sort of policy? At, at all, or on this issue? I think we know we have some good things. I'm not sure. <laughs> <change bar, I laughs> Ask my job. <laughs> I, I, I would imagine, I, I hasn't guessed it. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're generally probably against. And Nigel's supports it. He's out to say, yeah. Oh, is he? Yeah. But, but well, he, Nigel's Nigel. policy isn't necessarily a fast policy because, <laughs> yeah, as, as we found <laughs> out, <laughs> and he, I mean, you can, because, I mean, I'm going to generalise slightly, but they do err on the. They're socially conservative. Yeah, socially conservative. So they're yeah. against things like gay marriage and they're against um, reducing the proportion of And all these are separate issues. Mm. But because they're against all those things, it's, chances are they'll be against this. Like, but I don't know. Yeah, but that's super libertarian, don't they? They're kind of, kind of gay, so they just, they'll be on their website. They're super libertarian, as long as you're not gay, as long as you're not gay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, as long as you're not gay, all sectors of society. Um, um, could you summarise your position? You're, you're in personally for the bill, but you feel there should be amendments, is that right? Absolutely, yeah. That's not clear. I'm personally for uh, there needs to be uh, a number of amendments for clarifications. And hopefully, my clarifications very or amendments won't take too long for it to uh, be saved by the going to the House of Commons. But I think it's really important that every single. I'm, I'm quite <coughs> forensic when I look through pieces of legislation, particularly on things like this, when you know it's about life or death, effectively. I will go through every single line. I'm not a lawyer, I'm, I'm, my other half is a lawyer. So I've been a uh, been over there many times. But you have to go through every single one and look at every single piece of implication because as soon as you end up with any grey areas within the courts, the, uh, within a piece of law, the courts will absolutely take it uh, apart. And I think it's really important that we do spend time uh, going through it. Would you support it without any amendments? No. No. Sorry. Because of the things I mentioned earlier. One thing that wasn't application. So if you're looking at, for example, those of us who work in the NHS in Bath, uh, you will know that they're doing their Your Care Your Way um, programme at the moment, whereby you get a choice of where you want to pass away. Now, the implications of this legislation on how it is in practice regulated within the NHS is going to be a huge area of debate, and I can imagine it will need supplementary uh, legislation. Um, to ensure that we end up with proper regulation on that because, uh, to be frank, if everyone in the UK with a growing elderly population is deciding that they all want to end up um, dying at home, how the heck do we end up with enough medical professionals to ensure that you are ending up enforcing the legislation here and uh, regulating it effectively enough? So um, that is another huge grey area and Falkland's <coughs> bill does I hate to say, uh, bat a lot off to the Secretary of State for Health. And we were at the Health and Social Care uh, hustings a couple of nights ago. And of course, now that the Secretary of State no longer has um, the legal uh, position to um, be in charge of uh, healthcare provision, but in fact just needs to make sure that things are running uh, effectively enough. I can't remember exactly what the word is. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting um, debate that will go on between the House of Lords and the House of Commons over the next few uh, years, I can imagine, as well. So we need to make sure that it's absolutely crystal clear and concrete before anything goes off to the courts to end up um, 
deciding where, who, what lies where. Can, can I just bring us back to, I mean, the application is important, but we, we need to get there first. Um, just to be clear on my view, um, I would, like, would personally like to see this piece of legislation passed as is. I think there's some amendments which would strengthen it, but if those amendments didn't happen, I would still support this piece of legislation, and I think that's important. Uh, the main reason why it's important is, again, the High Court have made it very clear that they want Parliament to give clear guidance on this issue. If Parliament refuses to pass this proposal, then there's only there's a couple of conclusions from that. Firstly, that, the, that Section 2 of the 1961 Suicide Act is applicable, and therefore that leaves open the risk that anybody, such as Debbie Purdy's husband, which was the case she took through the court, could be open to prosecution with a maximum sentence of up to 14 years if they assist somebody in arranging their own, uh, you know, their, their death to, to the manner and timing of, of their own choice. Um, secondly, the court has been very clear, the High Court has been very clear that the country's stance is incompatible with the human rights side. So we're potentially leaving Britain at risk of legal challenge at a higher level in Europe on that issue and the whole decision could be taken out of our hands. So I think we've been given, we've been put very clearly on notice by the legal system that we have to clarify this issue one way or the other. And given that they've, they've agreed that it is incompatible with human rights legislation, I think to not support something along the lines of this could see this issue being dragged through the courts endlessly and the huge impact that would have upon individuals who want certainty we want to be able to, as I said, make decisions that are appropriate for them and their family members. I think it would be very disappointing if this wasn't passed, and therefore I hope that people who agree with the principle wouldn't throw out the good in the quest of the better. I think we all agree that in principle and on the, uh, on the piece of legislation itself, it's a very good piece of legislation, there's no doubt about that, that if you in any way, and I say this as someone who tried to adopt it, any way cast doubt on the uh, protection of medical professional making that judgment at the time, that they might end up having to go to court themselves without any particular protection because the legislation is far too weak, then we could end up jeopardising any chance whatsoever of any medical professional turning up and uh, adjudicating on uh, the, the, the code of practice that are uh, mentioned in this uh, piece of legislation. So that's why, I, I mean, yes, there's an absolute imperative to get this through as quickly as possible to ensure that we don't end up having the European Convention on Human Rights on our back. But at the same time, um, as MPs, uh, if we do become the MP, um, uh, Steve, we've got to make sure that we are absolutely forensic in our approach on every single piece of legislation. Absolutely. And I am absolutely forensic when I look at it, and I will continue to be so, because I know when I get letters from people like that constituent who are going to end up benefiting or losing out as a result of my decision, then I've got to have some sort of answer to give back to that person. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure, certainly you, Kip, and I think also observers want to get rid of the European uh, Convention on Human Rights, which would, which would provide, I guess, a way out on that. But America is the most litigious nation on earth. I think it's not unfair to say that. For nearly 20 years, they've had effectively the same piece of legislation in place, and it's worked. Yes, we have the iron crisis here, but, you know, my God, if America can make something like this work, then I have faith that we can find a way of doing it as well. And, and I, I hope to God. You know, but, but we don't get rid of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights because there's so many issues in which this country has kind of been knocked into shape uh, in a positive way by having, uh, by having you know, some sort of guidance beyond our shores on, on sensible matters. That's what time we've got the room until we can go on to that. I mean, yes, if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just wondering if Mike um, has got note of the amendments and to see if oh, yeah. that yeah, can be followed up. Can I, can I okay. ask one question? I, I can do that one too. <laughs> the, did you, in terms of the polling that you've done, uh, and presumably I mean, you said that at the moment it seems that only a third of MPs support the bill. I mean, um, did, how has that been carried out? I mean, is that... Um, I think it, we use, uh, yeah, this is like uh, agency we use, uh, 
dogs, and uh, and there's that, and then we, we have members that talk, you know, ask their MPs, and they feed that back to us. I'm just, I, I just still can't go over it, it just seems mm -hmm. like a, an amazingly um, small proportion. And a large proportion of our, our members are conservative voting, yet the largest number of MPs that support us are, are Labour. So, and, uh, yeah, is that largest percentage or largest number? L largest percentage, yeah. Really? Yeah, just figure it out. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily follow that the two thirds are against the legislation, is it? Um, no. Uh, yeah, I, I, I saw some of the bar chart. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think the point <laughs> that there's a large number of MPs are undecided. Yeah, oh yeah, that's, that's, so that's the thing. Well, there's only one for yeah. explicitly supporting, isn't necessarily an indicator. Actually, that, that, that's an important point for instance to make. There could be quite a large number of MPs who just absent themselves from any debate on this for fear of, you know, because they may or may not have any strong view or they may just not want to offend anybody. Um, and so it could end up being a relative, you know, it could end up being a, a subsection of, of Parliament, those who have the strongest views at the side, you have to say, uh, which would be disappointing because I think it would be, you know, it's a very important piece of legislation. It would be mm -hmm. good to ensure that as many MPs as possible, you know, have their say either way. I'd be particularly disappointed if people just basically hide away because it's not being whipped, just because they don't want any flack from either side on it and just secrete themselves away and happen to be you know, out of the country or on important you know, cabinet business or, or whatever at the time. It's too important an issue for people to hide in dark corners. Yeah, you've got a half a mandate on this one. I think, um, I, need, I need to conclude now. Um, thank you very much for and uh, I really thank you so much. Can we show our appreciation? I mean, with two thirds of the peers in the House of Lords um, on the 16th of January voting in support of the bill, now there is judicial oversight. Um, I certainly um, see this bill going to be passed. That's, that's it. Um, yes. Uh, uh, you may have noticed that, that this proceeding has been recorded. Um, there's a, an initiative called Democratic Accountability Path, which is trying to make a record of all of the questions and uh, the candidates' uh, positions on various issues. Um, there's a website called Democratic Accountability Path. Just Google that and you'll find it. Um, and we hope uh, that. After the election, uh, candidate, the successful candidate will be coming back to uh, his or her constituents uh, and reporting back on issues exactly like this. Um, so this is an initiative that you can follow through through the website initially, um, but we'll also have after the election particular forum meetings. Uh, so if there's any got no friends or people who weren't happy to get here tonight, in due course we hope that the uh, record of what the candidates have said will be available through the website and so they can go there. Democratic accounts will do that. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you to Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. For organizing Thank you. Thank you.